dose would you start people on or is it weight dependent? Um, I don't think it's weight dependent. Um, I, I start slow. I mean, I'm one or two milligrams and then just stick with that and then just slowly creep up. It's something you're going to be taking for a long, long period mm -hmm. of time. There's no, there's no rush, you know, again, right. unless you have a cardiomyopathy or you have yeah. some severe um, immune dysfunction that you think it's going to affect you know, an acute pathology or something that you're really suffering with. But if you're doing this for the long haul, you know, take, you know, be the turtle, don't be the hare, right? <laughs> be, be the turtle and be nice and consistent. Not only are you going to avoid problems, but you'll start to have greater insight. And I'll use me, for example, I, I don't, I hadn't taken rapamycin, you know, I was well knowledgeable in it, but when I got involved with, you know, this telehealth company, um, I said, you know, maybe I need to, <laughs> I need to experience myself. I had experience with a number of people dosing it to it, but it's something that I was doing a bunch of other things. So I'm like, mm -hmm. it would just muddy the waters on, you know, the signal on, on some of these other um, therapies. So I said, all right, I'm going to take it. You know, my wife had good, res good response with it. And I literally started one milligram every two weeks and I worked up to four and about three, uh, I think on the, I took four and I, I had a hives on or like a little urticaria on my neck. I really didn't think anything of it. I thought it was something else. So I ignored it. And the next time I took four, three days later, I woke up and, you know, if anyone ever wore braces, um, it felt like I just got braces on and the dent, you know, orthodontist just tightened them two times too, too tight. Just my, my teeth and gum were just really painful and you know I, I have a pretty high pain tolerance and for two nights it was like i just didn't sleep well at all it was because it was that painful and it's like hmm and it was just four every two weeks and it wasn't an apis apis ulcer you know that people work through which is unclear it was just really sore gums and i'm, I'm not quite clear what that response was and why i might revisit or go back but I stopped. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe, maybe I don't need it. You know, maybe I'm just metabolically because I do a lot of the other things I was pushing and, and it could drive something to do with, uh, I, I'm only postulating, you know, one, one of the ways that rapamycin, you know, works is mitochondrial function. It also affects iron and copper. And it could be, um, I drove this heme oxygenase pathway to produce more carbon monoxide, which is inflammatory. I also have been donating blood for a bunch of years. So my iron levels are low. I take copper. So I, I could have been an outlier in this. So the, the point is I didn't, I perhaps I don't need it. Right. You know, it was something, you know, I'm fit. I have good muscle and lean visceral fat. Why am I taking it? You know, and even if you look at the mouse studies, it's like, you know, look at the curves. It's like, it moves them 10%. And it's like, all right. Um, you know, the mice can't intervene to be metabolically healthy to begin with and mice die of cancer. So I'm not sure. Maybe it's just not something that, that's appropriate for me at this point, maybe in 20 years, but then on the other hand, in 20 years, we better have something a lot better than just rapamycin. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking ahead. Yeah, but but it's it, but it's part of deciding who who it's who it's worth for and what yeah. what is my for me what would be my incremental benefit some theoretical hmm. improvement or decreased risk in some of the main diseases that would kill me before my theoretical expiration date. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we have data that says that's going to, you know, the the risk in perhaps me would outweigh that. I want to take it, <laughs> but, but I'm, I, you know, that's because we want to do stuff. But um, I think I'll hold again for a little bit.
But we yeah. need to we need to think that way, right? We need to not get lured by this shiny object. And I'm I'm totally for rapamycin. I think it's one of our more you know useful therapies for the right person in the right dose with the right tracking. Yes. Did, have you have you seen other side effects in your clients? Um, I think it, it breaks down into probably three, you know, the metabolic consequences, mm -hmm. you know, people see their lipids go up and get all, uh, all upset about that. And I'm definitely for the most part, one that feels if you have strong metabolic health, don't worry about cholesterol, like, or don't worry about lipids because it's metabolic health is, is your driving factor. And, you know, I, people may be aghast about the ApoB issue, but ah, we need to look at all the different pieces to this and then decide where each person is. So, um, but you see metabolic issues for sure. And we just, we discuss mm -hmm. why and what the consequences are of that. You know, I don't know what we don't know is, are we, would those metabolic issues, one, they do improve with changing the dosing, but if we're changing the dosing, are we changing the beneficial signal? So we've cut down mTOR, but we've also cut down mTOR1, so we may not get the longer-term benefits that we're hoping for. Um, and then two is, and this is, hopefully we'll get this data um, when we're starting this year to really be more diligent on tracking this data that's 3,000 people on rapamycin is there a, at least any subjective person of subjective objective based on serum chemistry right because not everyone is going to do a full omic genomic analysis where we're going to be able to say you know this is exactly what you need it's just you know, not realistic, you know, from a cost perspective for most people, it's available if they want, but most people are going to just do a serum chemistry and look at their metabolic health. But if someone's coming in metabolically unhealthy, are they more likely to have metabolic negative consequences than someone who comes in metabolically healthy? You know, we're in that metabolic inflexibility that we talked about are they? I, I suspect if they're on either side of the curve, they're probably more at risk to having some consequence, but that's just my suspicion. The other area is skin issues. Like we, there's a whole class of itises, right? So dermatitis or, you know, some typically not joint, but just some skin type weird inflammation, you know, a rash or an urticaria. Um, definitely the ape, the ulcer, you know, is, but people tend to work through that. They seem to adapt to that. And then it doesn't become a problem. Others, it seems to be recurrent and it's unclear. Like, you know, I've tried to, you know, I've listened to, you know, the rapamycin experts, right. And I think even Matt Caberling and Krister and interviewing people, no one's really had a specific hard response to that and lots of people theorizing on rapamycin news as well what the cause is and i don't see one particular thing that jumps out to me or that i've been able to hang my hat on and um there, there's really the three major um issues i haven't seen you know any data yet you know where the dosing is affecting immune markers, right? And that's, I think the next level where we need to pay attention to, you know, looking at even, we're gonna look at simply, you know, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which is mm -hmm. a sort of up and coming more specific as part of the CBC. You can look at the monocyte lymphocyte ratio. Those are helpful to sort of gauge where the body is. Um, you know, looking at with um, true diagnostics omics, um, report they do do some CD4, CD8, um, and some other immune markers to sort of calculate or or prognosticate what your you know immune 
resilience would be. So that's that's sort of a next level. Um, and then there's a company called, you know, two two other Sapir Bio is out of Chapel Hill. They've sort of taken the UCLA immune um, test and upgraded that, um, and they're they're actually looking at naive and senescent T cells, and that those would be and they. They're they're not commercially available, but they've seen just so off, you know, sort of I've been told anecdotally, because you know, they don't have the data that they have seen people where the response is very good, but only when the dose is right. So mm -hmm. they've seen like some people where the dose wasn't right, they didn't get the response they were hoping for, but when they adjusted the dose, that response changes. So again, that's an anecdotal off the record response from them. But I think that's intuitively what we would expect to see. So using any of these advanced markers and we'll we'll dial these in, you know, glycan age even would be, um, we're gonna hopefully put a, a cohort through those and see if we see an improvement, you know, less, less the age component, but more glycan age now has um, deeper metrics where they're actually showing patterns of you know these glycans and depending on the pattern of these four or five different glycans that they're studying it's predictive or prognosticative to a particular illness so i would hope that we'd see those improve or at least not worsen mm -hmm. right right it, it may not affect it but it's like i don't want to see it get worse and that right. that would be so So in my mind, it's like start slow, follow something, <laughs> follow follow something. Whether it's just the CBC NL ratio, subjectively, I hopefully you know something metabolically, and then periodically do one of the advanced tests. You know, start with a base, and if you go slow, you know, do one of these advanced tests, and you know, pay attention. <clears throat> Did it move the needle in the right direction? And, you know, within that realm, if you're going to start rapamycin or, it's okay, you know, rapamycin and carbos, I, I, I think, or rapamycin and I, I tend to favor berberine it's, as opposed to metformin. Um, I don't think there's, or dihydroberberine even better. Metformin, I don't like anything that's poisoning or interfering with, with an electron transport chain. You know, so, you know, people who use metformin who are, and I tend to work with people who are more performance oriented, they lose their top end, you know, and one of the ways metformin is it's sort of taking your horsepower and throttling it down a bit. So now you can't drive your car as fast. So you're going to have less waste in essence, you know, less electron reactive stress um, in essence, because, you know, the first electron transport chain module is, is just not working as as fast and that's okay for some people you know if, if you're not a, a cyclist or someone doing crossfit or some high-end it, it'll and i don't know have you seen anything with actually i've never looked that up vo2 i, I it can't be as good um v, no. metformin and vo2 max no i i it just can't be <laughs> right it just right it, it can't be so I prefer dihydro something with AMPK driven, you know, dihydroberberine um, as well. And you know, there's a new molecule you've probably come across and be worth interviewing um, the founders of Fatty Fifteen and their mm -hmm. research with penta pentadeca acid and dolphins. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's they're, they're quite interesting, and it's you know whether it's just a that that they did a study and showed that it had a similar effect to rapamycin, you know, in vivo as, I'm sorry, C15 had a similar effect to rapamycin in vivo. And C15 has been lost because we're not eating enough saturated fats. And it's been one of these nutrients that's been lost in our diet. Whether you can take higher amounts of C15, you know, to have more of a pharmaceutical effect or whether it's just replacing C15 or getting enough in your diet through certain types of grass-fed dairy, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's unclear to me. I haven't gone that deep yet. I, it's still not quite known. Right. So, um, yeah. So AMPK mTOR would be 
you know, the dihydroberberine is pretty safe to do. Um, and that might be a good combination. I do, um, I, I take a carbos, but I, I take it more for its effect on butyrate in the gut than its glucose effect. Mm -hmm.